Hello, and welcome to a close reading with the Bill of Rights Institute. My name is Kirk Higgins. I'm the Senior Manager for Education here at the Bill of Rights Institute, and I am joined by my colleague, Tony Williams. Hello, Kirk. Hello, everyone, all our teachers and students out there. Yeah, we're, we appreciate you all tuning in. Um, today, we have the task of taking a close look at Washington, George Washington's first inaugural address um, and his farewell address. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you about this, Tony, because uh, George Washington is someone that you have thought and written a lot about um, over 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 the years, um, as you've been sort of thinking about U.S. history and, um, and and in your work with the Bill of Rights Institute. Um, and I was wondering, you know, just to start with, if you could just give us a just sort of a brief background. Um, first of all, the first inaugural address. So um, we know that George Washington was elected um, uh, to be the first president after the Constitutional Convention, after serving as president of the convention. Um, I think he wasn't very active in the ratification process, but you can correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, and in fact, throughout the day today, you should be welcome to correct me. Um, and all those who are listening, um, if you have thoughts or questions, um, please add them in the comments below. We'll try to respond to as many of them as possible. Um, but, you know, after he's elected, um, he's in retirement at Mount Vernon, he decides to come back and, and he gives this um, inaugural address. And so I was wondering if you could kind of set the stage for what that inaugural address is, why he decided to do an inaugural address in the first place and, and, and how this came about. Right. No, that, that's great context. Thanks, Kirk. So, uh, you know, the Constitution was indeed recently ratified and Washington, as you say, was president of the convention and he he did not participate in sort of the, the partisan fray uh, between the Federalists and the anti federalists I think he wanted to stay above that, uh, above that partisanship. He had attended the convention and affixed his signature to the document, and he wrote a, a letter or two that he knew would be made public, but all of that announced his support for it. So he didn't need to go to Richmond to the Virginia Ratifying Convention or or really write Federalist papers or, or anything like that, he, everyone knew he supported this new government and this new document. And I think that's really important. And, and, and everyone knew he was gonna be the first president. They really shaped the presidency with Washington in mind. Uh, and so, uh, and, and he is unanimously uh, elected president. And he was very reluctant though. You know, he had served his country for a number of years in the war, uh, was, was along, uh, was away from home, Mount Vernon, for, for some eight years and, and had already served in public life for, for several decades. And uh, I, I think he says to one friend, he, he felt like a prisoner going to his execution. I mean, that's how much he really wanted to stay at home with Martha and not get engaged in sort of the whirly gig of politics. But I think he really felt the call of his country and, and like a good Roman, if you will, uh, he, he answered that call. But I also think it's important to note that it wasn't just the, the presidency, but the Congress is up and going already. It had, uh, you know, the representatives had started assembling in, in March. And so they were trying to assemble a quorum uh, and help start setting up the government. And so forth. So there are, you know, the other branches of government are, are, are getting to work uh, even before Washington arrives. And it's important to note that the, the first capital was, of course, in, in New York, right? Uh, no Washington, D.C. yet. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here um, so we can start picking at the document, because I think you noted a couple things that that I wanted to touch on right at the beginning, which you know, we're talking about that reluctance. And it was interesting to me in reading through this, reading through the first inaugural, um, that that reluctance is is right out in the open. And it's, you know, it, it, it I think Washington fascinates me. Um, and I think Ron Chernow in his biography, um, Washington Life kind of points this out that like Washington's kind of this marble man. And we, we see him as like the actions that he took, but it's really hard to get to the, the real person that is Washington. Um, and it struck me reading these first opening lines, as flowery as they are, uh, that, you know, if this was anyone else, you'd almost think this was just another politician who's thrown out like, oh, I don't want to do this, but you've called me out. Um, and, and you, you know, the, my country he says here on line four, I was summoned by my country whose voice I can never hear, but with veneration and love from a retreat which I had chosen with the fondest predilection and in my flattering hopes with an immutable decision at the asylum of my declining years. 
you know, I think from a lot of politicians in American history, you pass over that line like, oh, yeah, it's rhetorical, whatever else. But for some reason, reading this from Washington, you really get the sense that that he meant it and that it was genuine. Right. And, and I think it's, it's really important to note, uh, you know, that, that Washington, whenever he accepted the, the commander in chief, accepted various uh, the presidency of the convention and, and now and now the presidency for the nation is he expresses that humility. Uh, and 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 that virtue, uh, and and I think that it was it was really sincerely meant. Uh, and you know, don't forget he had also not only accepted those offices previously, but he had retired from them. And for him, you know, the, those reti- retirements were, were sacred obligations, right? And it was it was only a Caesar uh, who had that ambition for power and who lusted after that power. Uh, rather, he wanted to be the Cincinnatus, right? Uh, that that citizen who is called to his service, but then retires to his plow, retires to his estate. And I think for Washington, uh, as you comb through his letters and, and other statements, they're really sincerely held uh, predilections on his part that he's willing to serve his country, but he he wants to retire uh, and uh, not not you know suffer the burdens of office. And so one thing to keep in mind too, that I think is interesting and and is interesting to to point out for students as well, you know, is the the practicality of this first inaugural address. So obviously Washington's coming in without any precedent. Um, And so I'm just curious, you know, he writes this in, in, I didn't include it here, but the opening is to, you know, the country and the members of the House of Representatives in the Senate. So he's really delivering this to Congress, ostensibly. Um, And that seems to be very deliberate. And he touches on that a little bit in the document as well. Um, Can you maybe talk just a little bit about why he was doing that, what what he was hoping to accomplish with this? Um, And I also know that one of those members of Congress, uh, James Madison, uh, is rumored to have had a hand in uh, the authoring of of this inaugural. So if you had any comments or thoughts on that as well. Yeah, well, well, maybe we'll do that first. Uh, you know, uh, Madison and, and Washington were very close during this period, and 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 Madison was a was a trusted advisor, and he actually really helped Washington write this uh, inaugural address. And the funny thing is, Madison then penned the response uh, of of the House of Representatives, and to Washington thanking him, and then Madison wrote the note from. Washington thanking the Congress for thanking him. <laughs> so Madison's having this monologue with himself, if you will. Uh, but uh, it is important. I think that Washington is not only writing to his fellow citizens, of which he considers himself one, uh, but also to the Congress, right? He really saw a, a, a deferential uh, understanding to the the main branch of government really representing the people very closely uh and so washington wants to lay down important precedents uh of which that is is no small uh precedent on on in in his thinking that that this is the the people's government yeah and i think i think some of that comes out here too, and here I'm looking just starting at 27, but I know there's a couple things in this section that we wanted to talk about, but you know, it says, such being the impression under which I have in obedience to the public summons repaired to the present station, it would be uh, peculiarly improper to omit in the first official act my fervent supplications to the Almighty Being who rules over the universe and who provides over the Council of Nations and whose providential aid um, can supply every human defect that his people benediction uh, may consecrate to the liberties and happiness of the people of the United States. Um, after that, though, he goes into talking about really what he's seeing, I think, as the role of government, um, a government instituted by themselves for these essential purposes. I think, um, and I'm curious here, he seems to be trying to orient the nation. It's almost like a, like a, um, I don't know, like an opening paragraph, this entire document, it's almost like an opening paragraph to not only the rest of his presidency, but like the direction he feels the nation should go, um, and, and, you know, it feels, am I wrong? And when I was reading through this, it seems like that's what he's pointing to is sort of like the purpose of government is sort of what he's getting at here. Right. You know, I think that 
he frames it as a prayer uh, to the Almighty, but I do think that within that context, it's a very Lockean sentiment that he is expressing here. I mean, it's it's really right out of the Declaration of Independence, right? So he's referring to the liberties of the people, the happiness uh, of the people, and so government is instituted to protect those liberties, and so that the people may pursue their own happiness and. He says a, a government instituted by themselves for these essential purposes. I mean, it, he's very much expressing the idea of we the people or popular sovereignty, uh, popular government. You know, for Washington, this is the whole reason why they fought a revolution for eight years uh, was to have that popular government. And so I, I think he's expressing some noble Lockean sentiments here. And laying it down right, right at the beginning, right, right in his first inaugural address, laying down the idea of the people's liberties, natural rights, inalienable rights, and the purpose of government to protect those rights and to allow them to live freely and govern themselves. Yeah, and I think I think that idea of of what it, what is required of us to govern ourselves is another theme that that struck me throughout throughout this document. Um, and I'll just pause really quickly to say again. You know, if anybody has any questions or anything that you want to field to Tony or I, feel free to put them down in the comments below. We'll, we'll try and respond to as many of those as we can. Um, but but turning back here to um, to looking at the document, um, you know, it, he seems to be hearkening a lot to the revolution as well, which is interesting because it's almost as if the Articles of Confederation never happened. Um, it seems as though we're, we're kind of jumping, um, you know, and he says in, in the important revolution just accomplished um, the system of their united united government, which I think there he's talking about almost a second revolution, with with the with the foundation of the Constitution. But but this very much does seem like there's no pause between the revolution ending in 1783 and Washington being inaugurated in 1789. Um, was that the way that they were viewing it, or is that just you know again my my sort of you know sloppy reading of the of the document? Yeah, you know, I, I think that what Washington is doing here, his purpose is not to provide a summary of, of the past 15 years, right? He's not playing historian here, but what I think he's doing is laying down a framework here for unity, okay, unity in this new government, unity of the people. We just came out of a, a very rancorous uh, deliberative process over the Constitution, and, and there was a very fierce debate about it. And, and the outcome, getting that new Constitution ratified, was, was never certain, right? It was, it was not a guaranteed outcome. And so I think Washington is trying to sort of smooth that over and, and really promote a unity, saying, okay, we had that debate. It's, it's been settled. We have this new government. And, and we're in it together, you might say. Yeah, and I really like the line he concludes with here. You will join me, I trust, in thinking that there are none under the influence of which the proceedings of a new and free government can more auspiciously commence. You know, I mean, it's very much that that hopeful hopeful tone and one um, of unity, which, like you said, I mean, is is required, especially at a moment when a new government is being put out and and not even all 13 colonies had signed on at this point, right? right. Because I think Rhode Island was still yeah. holding out. If in I'm, North Carolina. Yeah. In North Carolina. Yeah, yeah, and I would say that, you know, Washington has, has a real sense here uh, throughout the, the, the deliberations over the Constitution, setting up the new government, that this, this is an auspicious time that it's a, it's a time of enlightenment. It's a time where he says elsewhere that the, the, you know, sort of political principles and rights of, of humankind have never been more clearly understood. And he's also looking at these sort of auspicious beginnings of, of the Republic in, in a very deliberative process, right? Almost that the world had not seen before. And, and so I think Washington is saying, look, we've been very blessed, very fortunate to have such unique circumstances in which to build a Republic. And I think he's setting up the idea that we have a duty to preserve that. We have a duty to make it work because he and many others feared that it would not. Right. He, uh, 
republics and democracies throughout history, there were only a handful of examples, but they had all failed, right? And so I think he's he's setting up that discussion. Yeah, I think I think that's all really interesting. And and here in this section, I think we're getting back into what we were referring to earlier, which is Washington as like precedent setter, um, and 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 that reverence for um, that reverence for the 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 Congress that he feels he needs to have. I mean, I think it's interesting that you know it has made the duty of the president to recommend to your consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. Um, you know. Uh, saying that we're recommending consideration, I think, is not something we hear very often um, from any branch of the government these days. But the fact that Washington went out of his way to, to underline that um, and yet not to go into anything political. It is interesting to me that there's there's not a lot of political uh, statements he's not outlining, which I think has become sort of the the way these are approached now is to sort of outline the um, the, the platform that the new executive is going to be executing on. I mean, that's Washington is not doing that here. It's almost like instead of talking about his platform, he's going to talk about how he's going to be president, uh, which seems a, a, to be a departure, at least from, uh, from the way we may handle it now. Right. Yeah. You know, a lot of this is is principles. It's, it's about precedence. It's about, you know, a, a common purpose laying down that spirit. Uh, it's not a prescriptive list of his legislative agenda, uh, what he's going to achieve in the next hundred days or, or next four years or whatever. Uh, and so it does look in many ways very different from our modern inaugural addresses. Um, and, you know, I think here he's really laying down like, look, if we're going to have a republic, if this is going to survive, we need to do uh, certain things. Uh, and so, it's, it's, it's sort of an advisory uh, as well uh, to, to the people. Yeah, and I guess, you know, I, I see here, and this is even before parties really broke out, but um, down toward, can't quite tell uh, where this is, but, but starting with in here, he says, in these honorable qualifications, I behold the surest pledges that as on one side, no local prejudices or attachments, no separate views nor party animosities will misdirect comprehensive and equal eye which ought to watch over this great assemblage of communities and interests um I, that to me i mean it, it seems like there he's really speaking to those who may have opposed the opposed the constitution and 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 yet kind of warning to say look you know there's uh, we're, we're we're engaging in something that is bigger than ourselves we need to really commit to seeing it that way um or there may be some some tension Right. I think that's right. And, and I think that, um, you know, it's kind of funny reading this because you think about how divisive the 1790s were. Uh, and so a lot of his hopes did not really come true. I mean, there's, there's sectionalism in the, se in, in the 1790s. There's a sort of rank partisanship. And, you know, I mean, I think M Madison really understood that uh, in, in Federalist 10, where he warns about these factions and so forth, but says they're part of human nature. And and I think Washington is hopeful. You see in messages throughout the 1780s and really even before that, and as certainly in the 1790s while president, he's really committed to this idea of a national union, uh, to, to nationhood itself. Um, and, and having that spirit of a common purpose, a common cause as Americans. Uh, and you know, I, I think he has good reason to do that. One is I think he's just committed to that to that ideal. But I think that we, we needn't forget that he staked so much of his personal reputation throughout an entire career over many decades of public service to that ideal, to that union, to that nation. Uh, and and if it failed, you know, it was going to affect him personally and, and his lasting reputation throughout the ages. So he had a he had a strong sense of, of destiny, of historical purpose in mind and, and of his own role and 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 the, the founders generally uh, their role in this for the ages, if you will. Well, and speaking of that sort of personal stake in things, um, I see Julius has a question, you know, did, did anyone respond negatively to this address? Um, 
you know, I guess, uh, what did, what did people make of the inaugural, the first inaugural? Uh, was it even something, I mean, was it just sort of a, something that happened and was a blip or, or was it, was it big news? I think that everything that I read is, was very positive. Uh, we don't really have a strong opposition press uh, starting yet. Um, and it's, and it, in a certain way, if I can put this informally, there was sort of a love fest early on about, you know, we're, you know, we're all in this together and we're going to set up the government and we're all Americans and, and isn't this great? And it, it didn't take long for that to collapse into partisanship and rancor and so forth and debates over foreign policy and domestic policy. But I think at least for the, that, that first year or two, uh, there was a, a, a great national unity and, and really you know, that, that sort of unwillingness to criticize Washington because he was seen as the father of his country, you know, that that even lasts a few more years. And, and it's really a sort of only in the in the, his second administration that that there's that and those kind of oblique or even direct personal attacks on Washington. Yeah, and I see Jessica ask a question related to that as well, um, you know, about Washington's position toward political parties. And we'll get that to that, I think, in, in just a, a couple a couple of minutes here when we talk about the the farewell, because he was certainly against that that partisanship. And he was, I think, concerned that that partisanship or or put another way, the loyalty to party um, would come at the at the expense of the national common interest or at the expense of being able to find and work towards um, common uh, common cause or, or common compromise right because it, it doesn't you know compromise isn't always uh you get half and i get half it, it, it's it's more complicated than that and so but that ability to sort of set aside um party interest in favor of national interest i think is something that washington was very concerned about yeah absolutely we will get to that but I, you know i think there's some really important things on this slide uh, right here you know washington talks a lot where he's talking about the the union between virtue and happiness on the on that third line between duty and advantage and and the genuine maxims of an honest and magnanimous policy you know uh he's really promoting the idea that a self-governing people needs to be a moral needs to be a virtuous people uh you know they need to literally be self-governing uh as citizens uh and so you know he's promoting that sense of, of civic duties, of, of civic, civic obligations and responsibilities, to be a good citizen. Uh, and, and it's only that, and, and he agrees with, with almost every other founder on that, that you, know, you needed a, a, a moral and virtuous self-governing people if a republic was going to last. Because don't forget, you know, in a monarchy, uh, we, we simply have to obey. <laughs> Uh, you know, we don't have to be virtuous, uh, but but in a, in a republic, you know, they saw that as as an essential uh, recipe, uh, part of the recipe in, in the success of, of a lasting republic. And he, he really talks about that in those last few lines there. He says in, in this sort of very famous expression of American exceptionalism, he says, since the preservation of the sacred fire of liberty and the destiny of the Republican model of government are justly considered as deeply and perhaps as finely staked on the experiment entrusted to the hands of the American people. You know, we can see that American exceptionalism not only here, but Broadly, perhaps some might see it as arrogance or ethnocentrism and, and that kind of thing. And I think we need to be wary that it doesn't become a jingoism uh, or, you know, an arrogance. But I, what I think here, I think there's a lot of humility here, actually. I think Washington is saying, look, in, in our perfect circumstances here, uh, in an enlightened age, uh, under a deliberative process, it, if we're not able to make this republic last and 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 be a good republic, uh, then it probably won't work any it won't work anywhere else because you know they all have less than favorable circumstances that we had. So, you know, it's a it's a duty, it's a charge to the American people uh, to to build a lasting republic uh, based upon a model of of good leader uh, of good not only good leadership but but also good citizenship. Uh, you know, it's really a call to action, if you will, uh, to his fellow citizens. Yeah, I think 
I think that's, you know, really, a really interesting way to look at that because it is, it requires a lot, self-government requires a lot of the individuals who are in it, you know, and, and one thing, even when we were talking about compromise and political parties, you know, that one of those habits and virtues that, that always comes to mind for me is that, that the, the necessity to listen, um, particularly when you're in a disagreement, right? Um, it's hard to do that. And it takes practice and deliberate action to say, you know, I am going to listen. I mean, in our personal lives, we see this all the time, but it's, it's, it's similarly difficult for those in political office. And, and that to me seems what, what Washington is, is pointing towards is, um, you know, that, that those kinds of habits or virtues, you know, are, are, are what you need to be mindful of and that we all need to practice and, and, and work towards. Right. I mean, a popular government is predicated upon the people and the deliberative process and, 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 participatory citizenship. I mean, if, if those things, you know, aren't there, it, it fails. Yeah. Um, and so I guess just to kind of wrap up our conversation um, with the inaugural, because I know we're, we're getting tight on time and the farewell is like a lot longer than this one, but uh, did you have any final thoughts here, Tony, before we, uh, before we jump to the, to the next document? Yeah, just one. Uh, the one prescriptive thing that he does is, is what you have on the screen. Uh, he does commend to the American people a, a Bill of Rights. Uh, he, he recommends that the first Congress take that up, and he really promotes what he calls a reverence for the characteristic rights of free men, of, of, of human beings. And so, uh, and, and don't forget, the president doesn't sign these amendments, uh, but he does recommend it to them. And I think he has an eye here towards not not appeasing, but but a magnanimous policy towards the anti-federalists, towards the federalists fulfilling their, their promise made during the ratification debate to uh, pass that Bill of Rights uh, if, if it were ratified. So I, I think he sees that as a sacred obligation uh, uh, not only to the anti-federalists, but also to just free government in general. So that's his one thing he promotes. Yeah, one of many. And I, and I see, and I, I'll, I'll go ahead and apologize up front to everybody. We picked two really rich documents, so we're not going to be able to go through line by line, but, uh, but I hope this has given you a sense for both. Um, we'll switch um, to the farewell address here in a second, um, but also would encourage you if you have any other follow-up questions, um, even after this conversation, um, feel free to reach out to us um, or, or um, on Twitter and on Facebook um, or, you know, here on YouTube to leave comments and, and we'll try to continue this conversation even after we, we wrap up here. And as I'm going to the, um, to the farewell, Tony, I see that Peter asked us a question about um, when, when it is that we started delivering um, these inaugural addresses to a public audience. Do you happen to know when that, when that was? Uh, I just can't recall off the top of my head, yeah. but he, uh, he did, um, you know, his inauguration was public to his fellow citizens. He was up there on, on the balcony, uh, federal hall, I believe. Uh, and you know, his, his fellow citizens witnessed this and then he did go into the, the chamber and, and deliver the address. Um, but notice you know, Washington is very much a, a man who loved theater and, and wanted to set the right precedence and so understood the importance of those gestures to the people, to the self-governing body of Congress. Yeah, and, and I think that is something that has certainly carried on. I don't know when it the first public address was made, but I do know that uh, traditionally um, when inaugural addresses were given publicly, they were given on the east side of the White House. Uh, but it was Ronald Reagan who switched it to the west side of the White House so that he could have ostensibly so he was facing California. But it was also, I think, so you could have the entire mall um, filled with with people. And that is now to to this day, traditionally, where um, we now give um, the inaugural address. So, Peter, I apologize. Not quite the answer you're probably looking for. But I've always thought that um, Ronald Reagan certainly being a president who was conscious of 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 theater um, a, a, as a part of being a public official. Um, um, made that move. Um, so switching to the farewell address now, we fast forwarded from 1789 to 1796. A few things happened in between. You know, we won't bother that. Um, but, uh, but, but Washington has, he serves that first term, um, I think nearly doesn't run for reelection for a second term, decides, you know, I, 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 I would put it this way, at least in my reading, he allows himself to be convinced uh, that a second term is required of him um, and, and so serves a second term, but after two terms, um, he's, 
he is he is well and truly tired of being a public official. Um, and I guess what quickly what what was his calculus for that? Was it that he wanted to set a two term president, or was it that he um, was just genuinely exhausted by the politics, or or did he feel as though um, you know that it was it was now for the for the best interest of the nation to go through the process of having and something he touches on here in the opening paragraph having an election that allows for another individual to take charge. Right. And, you know, I, I think Washington really wanted to retire after his first term. Uh, he really did. He really wanted to go back to Mount Vernon uh, and, and live out his remaining days with Martha uh, on his plantation. And he very reluctantly stayed in office. Uh, and it was only because his, his cabinet and, you know, the national government, national politics and, and the country in general was very divided very quickly. There was a fierce partisanship, particularly over Hamilton's economic plans, but also foreign policy issues and, and, and many others. It was a great deal of, of party rancor, uh, even within his administration. And so he really understood that he was a unifier, that that he it was his duty to stay on and and help guide the country during another term but he really very reluctantly did it um in fact he had madison draft a farewell address in 1792 he he was going to retire um and and like i said he he reluctantly stays in office um and it's kind of interesting uh as he goes to retire uh, in 1796, after the second term, he pulls out the Madison draft and he now is very close to Alexander Hamilton as his main advisor. Hamilton rewrites Madison's draft, uh, but Washington wanted Hamilton to keep some of Madison's material in there as a subtle signal to the uh, Jeffersonian Republicans, including Madison and Jefferson and others, that he was nonpartisan, that he was above that, that he thought that they had an important contribution, even if they didn't always get their way in, in the formulation of policy. Uh, but it was reaching out to sort of both sides and saying, sort of, I'm, a, if you will, an inclusive president who wants to hear from, from all sides. And, uh, and so that was very important, but it's really him and, and Hamilton collaborating on that, that final document that, that we have. And it's important to note that it was, was not a speech, right? It was printed in the newspapers and uh, it became a seminal document you know, in, in the American mind. It was read uh, starting in, in 1862, uh, in the, the Senate and, and read uh, annually uh, every year on Washington's birthday for that century. I really think it should rank as really one of the top three to five documents in, in, in our study of American history. And unfortunately it's been in many ways forgotten. Yeah, and so to that end, we're gonna we're gonna kind of skip around a little bit, I think, just because of the length of this document. But I, I hope that we can point out a few places where you might want to investigate with your students, because there's some really just rich passages here um, from this document. And I think, as I was mentioning before, you know, even in this opening, um, you know, the, the the world of 1796, I think, is 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 very different in a way from 1789. I think a lot of that comes out of just the practical experience of governing a nation with this government in place. There are, um, there are decisions that had to be made. Uh, whenever you make decisions, you tend to upset certain people and make other people happy. And um, from that sort of natural back and forth, that natural deliberation over policies, um, parties do begin to emerge. Um, I think to the um, disappointment probably of Washington and others, but, uh, but they do. And so 1796, we are in a much more partisan time. We're in a um, a more divided time. I think there are there are big issues up for consideration um, that that are being wrestled with, and Washington is stepping away from all that. And um, I just wanted to note before we hop around and look at a few different um, constitutional and civic principles uh, that are highlighted in the speech, just to to say here that I find it fascinating that he says, "Friends and fellow citizens." I think is a is a really interesting opening. Um, again, potentially rhetorical if if it's just Washington's rhetoric, but but it seems. It seems meaningful to me that he does that. Um, and then his first thing 
here is is to speak to um, the people in Washington is often referred to as the father of the nation, right? And, and this this does read though like it's a father consulting his children in a way um, to say, look, you know, th there's an important decision coming up for you. I'm stepping away, and you're going to clothe. He says, who you know, the person who is to be clothed with that important trust. Um, I think is a really a really powerful line, and I'm sure that the the father symbolism has been overplayed. But but I think this may be a place where some of that comes out just because of the way this is written, the tone he takes. Yeah. Uh, but but I think it's really interesting. Yeah, no, I think so, and I think that that's uh, very much frames this up very well because you know Washington is giving advice to his countrymen, uh, to his fellow citizens. You know they don't have to follow his advice, but he lays down really three or four key principles that really do shape a lot of the course of thinking of, of politicians, of statesmen throughout the 19th and 20th century. These, uh, you know, his prescriptions were in many ways um, not only sort of very important and sort of you know, advanced for their time, he understood not only the problems of his day, but the problems that could affect the country uh, for a long time. Uh, and so that's why I think his advice is salient for so long. And I'm gonna skip down to the first one of those um, that you had talked about, um, or that, that we, had, we had talked about covering, which is um, one of the things he, he, he really goes after is, um, making sure that there's a unity to what's going on. So thinking back again to what we saw in the inaugural of, of wanting to bind people together and point them towards the higher purpose that they're serving, that this is a national cause. Um, and, and in a democracy like we have, it's not a zero sum game. You're gonna lose as much as you win when it comes to policy discussions and, and, and conversations. Um, the important thing is that that conversation continues. And it seems here um, that Washington is again, sensitive to that. And Tony, if there's other lines that you want me to jump to, just let me know. But, um, but, but starting here, um, you know, this line of, you know, interwoven as is the love of liberty with every ligament of your heart, no recommendation of mine is necessary to fortify or confirm the attachment, you know, that starting off with this idea that, look, liberty is the aim to which we're, we're trying to preserve. And that's why the system of government is here is to ensure individual liberty um, continues to exist. And he says, the unity of government, which constitutes you one people is also now dear to you. Um, so he's making that connection to say, we fought in, in my estimation, we fought a revolution to preserve this thing called you know, liberty. And we are now have a union which is preserving that thing. Um, and you now see the people, um, how it is that that unity um, is, is working to preserve this and why that that is important. Right. Uh, and, you know, look at, look at how he speaks of union, right? Uh, he's, he calls it right up at the top there. The unity of government, which constitutes you as one people is now dear to you. It is justly so. It's a main pillar in the edifice of your real independence. So he sort of enumerates several ways that it's a pillar in the edifice of, of liberty. And he says, uh, uh, an edifice of your independence, of your domestic tranquility at home, your peace abroad, of your safety, of your political and economic prosperity, of that liberty, very liberty, which he so highly prized, right? I mean, so, so it really encompasses everything, right? So for him, the unity of government, the unity, the union, but also our unity as Americans, Right, even as we have differences and, and partisan views and so forth, that unity for him is so important. It's not everything depends on it, as you can see. And and he advises uh, several lines down about eight lines down. He says he advised that you you should cherish a cordial, habitual, and immovable attachment to it. Right, it's the palladium of your political safety and prosperity, and you should guard it. You should preserve it with jealous anxiety, right? Resisting every attempt to, to destroy it, right? Um, and, you know, we look back now, we're a nation who lived through a, a, a sectional civil war, uh, and we can see that it wasn't always followed, but 
but Washington really understood, especially as all these European empires are on in North American soil and they're contending on the high seas for, for dominance, that, that the Americans needed to be unified. Uh, otherwise, you know, it, they could be destroyed. Yeah, and, and here too, I'm seeing connections to, to other documents that I'm sure we'll explore at some point. But um, the one that really stands out for me is Daniel Webster's um, Liberty and Union um, speech, uh, which is his second reply to, to Haney during the, the Webster-Haney debates. Um, I mean, to me, that this gets directly at what, what Webster is talking about. And then even further, because it's uh, Abraham Lincoln then cribs a little bit from that speech um, in talking about a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And, and to me, and this probably speaks to, to what you meant about um, that this became a touchstone document, because it, there is something something packed in here that that is that is greater than even what he's talking about. You know, we can certainly know that that this liberty and, and the equality that that it points towards weren't perfectly achieved at this point, but it points towards something that that the project is working toward realizing, um, and, and that 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 jealous jealous anxiety is wanting to continue to to further and to achieve. Um, and it's interesting to kind of see that line, um, you know, through American history, where where this this theme of of union being greater than just a practical combina a practical alliance of states, you know, that it's a, it's something greater than that, um, which again is something Abraham Lincoln really really draws out. Yep, I think so. Um, so skipping down here um, and speaking directly to political parties, um, I, this is something we we touched on touched on earlier. But but this 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 danger of faction, um, you know, and, and that uh, that it that it gives uh, what does it take? that it gives artificial and extraordinary force. Um, you know, I think here is Washington coming out as someone who's been caught up in these partisan partisan rankings and in the the hurly burly of politics in the 1790s, which you noted was a was certainly a time of 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 challenge and disagreement, and and um, as the nation's trying to find its way forward, um, and I think what he says here is is really um, profound. Yeah, you know, there was a question about what was his view of parties, and and I think that he did equate them with faction. He equated them with self interest. Uh, very inimical, very destructive of the public good, of that unity among Americans. And I think, I think he feels this way not only because he was starting to be personally attacked and because he saw the divisions within his own government. Uh, I think those weighed on him uh, a great deal. But I think, you know, his general a very strong concern here about parties, and we'll look at some of his adjectives in a minute, to describe them, but you know, he's he shares the view of parties held by nearly. It was a nearly universal idea among among politicians, among the founders, uh, among the Americans of the day, that parties were bad. That that parties were destructive towards the public good uh, and and our common purpose and interest. And and yet they and all of them hated parties and yet they started within about three to four years or, or you know, two, three, four years after, after the government was created, after the nation started. And so again, perhaps part of human nature, right? We have differing views. We may agree on the principles of the founding. We may agree on liberty and tough government and so forth. But when you're sitting down in a prudential way to formulate domestic policy, taxes, uh, how you're going to deal with domestic insurrections like the the, the whiskey rebellion? Uh, what kind of foreign policy you're going to create? Which which countries you're going to support in case of wars? I mean, these are all very practical political decisions, and there are areas in which people disagree, uh, and that's very natural. And we see it today, and we saw it 200 years ago, and we'll see it 200 years from now. Uh, there, there's just not, you know, perfect unity and agreement on these things. And that's okay, but for, for Washington was very, very troubled about the effect that it would have on the survivor, survivability of the Republic. And let's say, see how he describes them. He calls them, you know, a small but artful and enterprising minority, right? They're, they're deceitful. They're, 
they're shadowy. They're interested in their own own self-interest. Uh, he calls them the ill-concerted projects of faction, the potent engines of cunning, ambition, and unprincipled men. Right? That they they subvert the power of the people, usurp the reins of government for unjust dominion, and he they promote what he calls the baneful effects of party. And they include the spirit of revenge. Uh, you know, it's just a highly charged and very, very negative assessment of the effects political parties have. Now, I don't know if people would feel that way today. Maybe they still would. Uh, maybe people feel that way about political parties today, or or at least the other uh, other person's party. Um, but you know, he he and and many of the other founders had a, a highly negative assessment of of political parties and their effect on a republic. Yeah, and I think I think that that distinction too between party and faction is interesting and one that that can be interesting to go into with with students. And we don't have time to really pick it apart today. I wish we did, but um, but but just the idea that. I think that the founders anticipated Madison writes about the Federalist Papers that faction would arise. I think the problem with parties was that it, it gave you something else you were dedicated to that you owed loyalty to um, mm -hmm. that was outside of serving your constituents and serving the nation. Um, and again, you know, the fact that parties sort of inevitably sprung up almost immediately maybe points toward the founders being a little bit, a little bit naive and just how it is that a, that, that, Human beings would practically organize themselves, um, you know, in a in a in a you know a republic in order to just function politically. Um, I think that's kind of why parties come about. Of course, uh, parties the nature of parties changes over the course of American history. But uh, but 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 the, that idea too that you know that they were anticipating factions and people grouping together, but they just thought that those groupings um, wouldn't be permanent. I think was was probably the way that they thought about it. Right, and it comes a lot out of the, the Whig ideology, the Republican ideology of, of the American Revolution, in which, you know, the, the, the unity, public, the public good, uh, sacrificing for the public good, patriotism, all these sort of classical ideals were very much at the heart of what they were fighting for against Great Britain. And, you know, so many like Washington and others want, want these ideals to go forward. And I think they understand human nature, uh, you know, and Madison clearly does in, in Federalist 10, but it, it, they still didn't like them, right? I mean, they knew they were part of nature, but that didn't mean they had to, had to like them or, or had to think that they were good uh, for, for public affairs. Right. And sort of speaking of that, that idealism and, and maybe idealism in a, a positive sense, maybe holding ourselves to a higher ideal, um, we wanted to touch on this section really quickly, um, starting on line 286 here and, and thinking about here how, you know, the, the, the indispensable supports of, of religion, religion and morality, Washington points to. Uh, but, but the idea that, that, there is, that there is a certain duty required of men and citizens, right, that, 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 that there, is, there is something that we need to, there, there, is, there is things that are incumbent upon ourselves that we need to be mindful of because of the responsibility now of self-government. Um, I've always thought that this passage is just um, really beautifully written um, and I think gets at the heart of what Washington saw as citizenship. Right. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with that. And, and I think that he says, look, of, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports, right? And, and he writes this, don't forget that, that Washington as president sent letters to many different religious denominations and really uh, advocate, was, was a very strong advocate, which I don't think he re receives enough credit for, for, for promoting religious liberty as a natural right, for promoting freedom of conscience, right? He writes to uh, Jews, he writes to Roman Catholics, he writes to, to Baptists and Presbyterians, many, many different denominations uh, and so and, and religions. And, and Washington really respects that. But he says here, like many other founders actually, that 
most people get their morality from a higher source, right? From religion. And he even concedes that possibly and from, from philosophy and, and, and reason. Uh, but he says most people back at the time, church going and, and primarily Protestants, uh, most people got their sense of morality from, from religion, from natural law. And that this made them better people, that this made them more moral, that this made them more virtuous. And therefore, that was the basis of good citizenship. So we sort of had this founding syllogism, this logical statement, this logical progression of religion is necessary for, for morality, for virtue, for goodness. And those things are the basis of self-government, of Republican self-government. Because don't forget, you know, the people needed to in a republic needed to govern themselves. They needed to exercise self-control. They needed to be moral beings. They needed to, uh, you know, to, to be good citizens, basically. Uh, and so that's that's all this is really saying, uh, but it is a very important principle, I think. Yeah, and I think, I think it's concluding short paragraph here is, is a really powerful one. Promote then as an object of primary importance institutions for the general diffusion of knowledge in proportion as the structure of a government gives force to public opinion. It is essential essential that that public opinion uh, should be enlightened, right? And I think it's it's pointing to, you know, uh, things I'm sure we all talk about with our own students, you know, be be aware of what's going on, you know, pay, pay attention to what the government's doing. It goes back to those, um, those, those, um, that jealous guarding of our liberty, right? I mean, that, that, is, that is how it is accomplished. It's on each of us to be paying attention to what politicians in our own, our own towns and our states and our, in the national government are all doing um, and how it is that, they're, that, that, that intersects with, with our own lives. Exactly, um, exactly so. And so one final uh, thing we want to touch on here, which I think is something that people often uh, state uh, with this is in regard to um, Washington's view on foreign policy. I think uh, for most people, if there's anything um, that, that, uh, that, that you can pull from the farewell address, I think it's this entangling alliances uh, language. Uh, and so I, you know, I just ask, you know, as we're, as we're getting to our final few minutes here, Tony, you know, did, did Washington expect us to be isolationist forever or, uh, or did he have some sense that uh, that world affairs may wash up on our shores at some point? Yeah, uh, yeah. Entangling alliances is actually Jefferson. Uh, he 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 tells us to avoid stay clear, steer clear of permanent alliances uh, with any portion of the world. And and I think one of the reasons why uh, to, to answer your question though is no. And and I don't think he understood this to be isolationist really at all. Uh, you know, I think that he understood that that Americans. Uh, needed to interact with the world uh, that was right and proper as a nation, that they should win respect uh, of the world, that, that they would defend their national interests and so have, have national security capability in terms of a military and so forth, uh, and that they'd also conduct commercial relations with the world. Uh, you know, I think that his principles in terms of how we're going to relate to the rest of the world are very important. And this is just a small list of all the things he talks about in, in over several paragraphs. He said, Americans should should uh, treat the rest of the world with honesty, with amity or, or friendship, with, with liberality in terms of their policies, with justice, humanity, uh, and that they are going to have commercial relations uh, with them. Uh, and so it's a principled foreign policy uh, but it's one that also defends American national interests. And I think what he's really saying about the, the alliances is that, and you see this during the, the wars of the French Revolution and then the Napoleonic Wars, uh, and then America goes to war against Great Britain in 1812, uh, and then later on becomes friends. But, you know, your friend today might not be your friend tomorrow, or it might be in your interest to be enemies of the country or friends uh, with a country or allies, but that may all change. Uh, and so Washington is saying, look, steer clear of permanent alliances, just jealously guard your own interests, but treat all countries in, in your constant interactions with them uh, with all these principles. Uh, so, you know, I think it's a, it's a really healthy and balanced approach uh, to to the conduct of diplomacy and 
in foreign policy, at least on paper. I think the principles are right. And I think Washington does get his foreign policies, his actual foreign policies correct. Uh, but, you know, it's hard uh, in, in a changing world, in a world at war, even in the 1790s, to, to apply these principles evenly, especially to satisfy everyone, because a lot of the, those foreign policies cause divisions at home as well, just as they do today. Yeah, absolutely. So as we're coming to the end here, Tony, is there is there anything else uh, that you think we ought to, ought to touch on? I, I scrolled down to the very end because I always like uh, concluding sentences and paragraphs, but uh, but uh, but I've appreciated you know doing our quick marks through both of these documents. I hope everybody watching um, was able to to take something from it. I wish we had more time to really go through it line by line, but hopefully we we pulled out a few snippets that might be interesting to go through with your your classes. But uh, but Tony, any 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 parting words? All right, well, someone did ask about do we know whether these are which ones are Hamilton and which one are Madison's words, and I do want to address that. Um, yeah, we do. Um, there's been some some studies of the farewell address, one by uh, a historian named Matthew Spaulding. I think it's called Sacred Union of Citizens, and I recommend that. And, and he does have some appendices, I think, where he goes through and shows you who was responsible for which parts of it. But in general, I would uh, be happy to conclude with our, our teachers and students here saying, you know, that these are, are very, not only important, important documents to read and go through and, and to learn, but, but also very relevant uh, documents to, to discuss because they have some of those unchanging immutable principles that address these perennial questions that keep coming up, uh, not only in American history, but right up through our current events today. Uh, and so uh, I, I really commend going through these documents to our teachers and students and to all of our fellow citizens. Absolutely. Our praise from Washington, right? Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. We really appreciated going through this with you and uh, we, we hope to see you again soon. So thank you so much. Thanks for watching everyone.